Hello, my name is Ollie. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. I'm a doctor living in England and working in the NHS. Now today I'm going to be talking to you all about something that happened quite a while ago now, a couple of months ago, as part of the neurology rotation that I've just completed and talked to you about in my foundation job in neurology experience. If you're interested, go ahead and watch that. But this one is going to be all about my taster week in neurosurgery, and there's a few different bits to unpack there. So before we jump into the specifics of what I got up to in this kind of reflective entry, what is a taster week? is the obvious place to start. To keep it really short and simple, a taster week is what it sounds like, more or less. It is a blocked out period of time, usually I think between two and five days, although virtually all of my colleagues I know that have done them take the full five days to get a taster experience of a particular specialty in medicine. So the way that this fundamentally works, right, is that all foundation doctors across their F1 and F2, their entire foundation program, have a certain amount of study leave budget that they can use for things like courses, uh, study leave for exams, things like that, and taster weeks come from this budget of time. And what you do is essentially apply for time away from your current job. So let's say that you are working in a I don't know, a general surgery or a general medicine job for four months as part of one of your foundation program rotations, you can apply to take a week out from that job, so you're taken off the rotor, you have no commitments to that job for this period of time, and instead you will be going and working in another specialty entirely. And the whole point of these experiences is essentially shadowing, learning, getting involved with the day-to-day -day operations and runnings of that specialty such that you can get a better insight into the specialty, the common problems, the management, the conditions that they deal with, but also to develop insight and prepare yourself potentially for a career in that specialty. You can do a taste a week in literally any specialty you like as long as your local foundation school can support it. So if you want to be a cardiologist you could go and spend a week with the cardiology team if you want to be a neurosurgeon you can go and spend a week with them if you want to be an anesthetist you can go and spend a week with them and there's two really key advantages i think to doing this and knowing about taster weeks and why they're important the first is to say that it's possible therefore to get dedicated experience and time in a specialty to which you would not normally have access. Certain specialties like, say, neurosurgery, cardiothoracic surgery, radiology, forensic pathology, will very, very rarely have FY1 and FY2 doctors working in them across the UK, purely because of the lack of centres that often run these services. Or in the case of specialties like radiology, there's not that much utility for a junior doctor that isn't specifically training in radiology to be around. So again, if you want that experience, a taste a week might be the way to go and do it. The second thing to probably know about is that at specialty selection, the recruitment process processes often reward electives and taster weeks and have specific points set aside for them. So you may find yourself in a position where, as odd as it is, let's say you already do a cardiology job as part of your general medicine rotation, if there were dedicated points available at specialty recruitment for a taster week, showing evidence of commitment to specialty, then you should still do your cardiology taste week because it shows evidence of commitment to specialty. You have gone out of your way to organize this placement, which then leads us very nicely onto how do I organize a taste week? That sounds great. I want to get involved and do one. Now I'll leave a link in the description below to the relevant guidance from Health Education England on how to organize and how to get the most of your taste week experience, but really, all you need on the ground is a consultant in the specialty that you want to go to that is willing to take you on and look after you. And the admin is really very minimal around that because you're essentially only applying for study leave for this specific thing. So that's where I would start if you want to do it in anaesthetics. I would just go and find an anaesthetics consultant, maybe the local training program director, and say, hey, I'm interested in anaesthetics. I want to come and do a taste week. And most consultants, in my experience, will be super, super supportive of having you because it means potentially another trainee, someone who is passionate and interested and engaged. I've never, ever heard of any resistance to a taste a week experience. And then really, you just need a fairly basic bare bones plan of what you want to achieve in that week. Again, the documents that I've linked give some guidance on 
the kinds of things that you should be seeing. So it's things like investigations and management of the common conditions that that specialty deals with. If it's something like surgery or anesthetics, obviously you should be getting involved and seeing the procedures that they do day to day and getting a flavor, a taster, of what the specialty is actually like to go and work in because by the time you're doing these taste a week experiences which should be either towards the end of your f1 your foundation program year one or more commonly in your f2 you're coming quite close to making the decision to applying for specialty training and so this is the time to explore those interests especially in specialties that you've not yet worked and exploring if that specialty might be right for you now I actually posted at the time what was going on during my taste week in neurosurgery and I've got a post up on my Instagram feed as to exactly what I got up to. So the first thing is a kind of public shout out of gratitude to Mr. Sarash, the consultant neurosurgeon who organized and facilitated my taste week where I'm working now. But now I want to take just a few seconds to tell you about today's very generous sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an online platform that is all about learning by doing. And those of us in medicine, we work to an apprenticeship model. We know that this is the way that people learn best. Brilliant is ultimately all about problem solving, using reasoning to reach a solution and interacting with the system to make sure that you're embedding your knowledge. And the thing that really makes it work for me is it's about promoting deep understanding Understanding of STEM, not just puzzles and brain teasers. For example, I need to talk to patients about probability all the time, so I had a look at their basic maths courses, including things like statistics, to brush up on my knowledge and make sure I understand them properly. Similarly, lots of you will want to apply to medical school and take entrance exams like the BMAT and UCAT. You will need your basic understanding of geometry and probability to do well, so I can wholeheartedly recommend getting hands-on solving problems to make sure Sure that you're taking that knowledge away with you and then you can use it later as a practicing clinician. Go down to the description now, take a look at the link there and the first 200 people to sign up using that link will get 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant. So perfect as a last minute Christmas present to yourself to help building knowledge in the new year. So just to go through some of the stuff that I saw on my neurosurgery taste a week, I've just got my, my diary in front of me here but Case one, when I came in first thing Monday morning, straight into theatres, which was awesome. We kind of agreed that getting that theatre exposure and being maximally immersed in the world of neurosurgery was probably the most useful thing for me to do, given that I locum in neurosurgery anyway and kind of already know what goes on on the wards. But the first case I saw in the morning was something called a decompressive hemilaminectomy, and essentially certain parts of the spine, that might be the bones themselves or the discs between the bones of the spine, are pressing on particular spinal nerves and causing people neurological problems or pain. You go in and you decompress by removing the lamina, that is part of the back of the bones of the spine that can sometimes press on those nerves. So you take a bit of bone out, release the pressure, and hopefully the patient gets better. Then in the afternoon, moving from the spine to the skull, a procedure called a craniotomy for tumor removal. And it's important to understand the difference here between a craniectomy and a craniotomy. Um, you learn a lot of Latin when you go through medical school. A craniotomy describes the process of making a hole in something essentially, so you are drilling a hole in the skull in order to gain access, but will put the bone flap that this generates back on the skull. When you're done, a craniectomy would be doing that same process, making a hole, but removing a flap of bone and not putting it back on. The suffix ectomy describes the removal of a thing, for example, an appendicectomy, removal of the appendix, or cholecystectomy, removal of the gallbladder. On the Tuesday, I got to see a quite different procedure, something called a brain biopsy, Again, a biopsy, as you will know, is taking a sample of tissue from a very, very particular place in the brain. And in this case, the way it was done is by using a system called Brain Lab. And this is a really amazing, kind of futuristic surgical system where what you do is you have a scan of the brain. In this case, it was an MRI scan, a magnet scan, very high detail look at the brain. And you can identify the area of the brain from that scan that you want to biopsy. But what surgeons will now often do as they're performing this biopsy is they place these stickers 
on the patient's head, which kind of map key distinctive points around the patient's brain. And what this then does is it allows the surgeons in the real world to align a probe, so they get a small surgical probe, and touch different points on the brain, on the head. And this actually shows up in a kind of virtual view on the MRI scan, so you can map perfectly the physical world, the patient's head that is in front of you, to this MRI scan that is showing up on the screens. And if you had the suitable equipment, you could actually do this in VR or augmented reality if you wished. It's creating an absolute physical link between the patient in front of you and this virtual set of imaging. It's very, very cool. And being able to go and see and examine the patient myself before the procedure was done really, I think, gave me a good insight into how the whole procedure goes. Then on to the third day of my taster, more theatre. I got to see a neurosurgeon doing a carpal tunnel release so what essentially happens is pressure inside the carpal tunnel in the wrist as you all know if any of you have had this condition causes neurological symptoms usually pain and tingling in the median nerve distribution the lateral three and a half fingers of the hand this kind of distribution here and the way that it's done is you cut the tendons here overlying the carpal tunnel which releases the pressure and makes the symptoms go away certainly in centers where i've been before very unusual for a neurosurgeon to be doing these, usually done by plastics, but well within the capability of the operating surgeon, so why not? A nice refresher of some anatomy that I've not thought about in quite a long time. And then the other procedure on this day, a ventriculoperitoneal shunt. So you'll have heard about conditions like hydrocephalus, water on the brain, where there is too much pressure within the ventricular system on the inside of the brain, which is causing symptoms. The way that you solve this problem is by performing a shunt, which describes a means of basically invoking flow between two previously unconnected environments. The way this is done is that a catheter is inserted into the ventricles and the inside of the head, which is then tunneled underneath the skin and ultimately winds up in the abdominal cavity. So the cerebrospinal fluid that would normally exist within the ventricles is shunted bypasses the normal drainage system into the spinal cord and goes around, winds up in the abdominal cavity where it can be absorbed like any other fluid. And then finally in the afternoon of this day, I did some data collection for a national neurosurgical study that just required talking to some of the neurosurgeons and theatre staff in the department and getting their thoughts and feelings on a particular tool that some scientists working down in London were trying to deploy. So not a lot of effort, but a nice little project to be involved with, and I enjoy my research, so it was nice to have some dedicated time to do that during this week. Moving on to the Thursday, I was then able to attend our normal pressure hydrocephalus clinic. Now, this is a kind of contentious diagnosis in area of medicine, especially among neurologists. But at my center, this is a joint clinic between neurology, neurosurgery, and our CSF specialist nursing team. So it's almost like an MDT clinic where you have all of these independent experts talking to and seeing patients at once. That was really interesting. Obviously may or may not end up in these patients going for neurosurgery. It was all about communication, discussion of risks and benefits and actually I've never seen that kind of clinic before where you have lots of different very highly specialized people coming from different places having a joint discussion really between all of the specialists and the patient and making the decision whether or not to go ahead with surgery and that's actually some of the data from that clinic that I find myself analyzing at the moment so it's really come to find me again full circle after this taster week. And then later on, a paediatric neurosurgery case, which is also quite unusual, something that I find really, really interesting in the area within neurosurgery, um, as subspecialist as it is, that I could really see myself doing. I love working with children, um, the particular communication challenges that come with that. So again, really grateful to be able to see that. And then finally, to round things up and to round this video up, I spent a day working with the neuro-interventional radiology team, so not neurosurgical at all, but increasingly neuro-IR, so not neurosurgeons, but radiologists that are trained to do neuro-interventional procedures. It's becoming much more of a thing. So historically, for example, aneurysms, these swellings in blood vessels in the brain, were always clipped by neurosurgeons where they open the brain up, put a small clip and clip off the vessel. Nowadays, a lot of that work is being done from inside 
the arteries and veins that supply the brain. So you can do it all with a wire that's fed up and up and up from the inside. And it's actually radiologists that do that work rather than neurosurgeons. Equally, there's a huge drive for what we call mechanical thrombectomy for stroke at the moment in the UK, where people have these infarcts that block off blood vessels in the brain, cause catastrophic problems. Just the same way you can go in with a wire fish out the clot within a certain time frame just like with heart attacks where cardiologists will do this work and increasingly a lot of surgical work in all specialties will probably go this way towards IR and it's certainly a specialty that I'm considering for myself um, particularly neuro IR uh, in the future so we will wait and see. And of course, I wasn't just observing, I was in hands-on scrubbed and assisting in as many of these cases as the surgeons would allow, and 90% of the time that was allowed, and they encouraged me in and were so, so welcoming and passionate about what they were doing. So I absolutely loved it. It was a fantastic experience and definitely one I'd do again. So thanks for watching, guys. Please be sure to hit that like button, leave me a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to go and check out my website. Thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring the channel. Have you got ideas about Taste Weeks? Let me know down in the comments. Take care and I'll see you next time.